Let us start the second tea time seminar of high school. First, let me introduce today's navigator, Professor Navrenchev from Russia. He is from uh, Novosibirsk. Yes, it's hard to pronounce. Uh, his talk on uh, tsunami simulation, and after that, uh, he will speak on the city uh, Novosibirsk. So, thank you. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Nagasawa for this um, very nice possibility to visit Saitama University. I was here very briefly, maybe six, six years ago. And now it's a good opportunity to show up the progress in our researches, which is now very much on demand, I believe, because it concerns the tsunami prediction. And prediction is based on simulation. So today, I would like to give some basic information why this challenging problem and what are the ways to contribute and probably to touch some, some problems which are still open. So this is the presentation plan which is not that informative. Uh, however, these Americans consider the slide with the presentation plan as an element of the culture of presentation. Anyway, we start with the general information. So first of all, I would uh, address the participants to the very nice, uh, say, uh, International Handbook of Earthquake and Engineering Seismology. Uh, this is the very well-known series, and the tsunami chapter has been written by Professor Kenji Satake. At that time, he was uh, employed by Japanese uh, Geological Survey. However, now he works for the University of Tokyo, and he is a top expert in tsunami tsunami-related problems and tsunami simulation. So the goal of the study is to predict tsunami as early as possible. So early warning, this is the goal. However, the false alarm is practically not acceptable. I will show later only one example. All of you know this, uh, this fact very very nice. And so uh, the modern computational technologies and facilities are really amazing. However, to calculate the propagation of the wave in order to calculate, we need to know the initial shape of the wave. And the basic available data do not provide this information. And uh, so uh, our study is oriented on two points. First, to contribute to the solution of this problem, to obtain the better information of the initial shape of the wave, and then to calculate the wave propagation as fast as possible. And unfortunately, both problems are not completely solved. There are different approaches, and uh, today and uh, the day after we do not have time to touch deeply all these approaches. They are different. And as usual, each approach has the positive points and negative points. For example, the using the satellite images. It's a very promising technique. The resolution of the satellite images are really very, very high. And in principle, it is possible to look at the ocean surface from the satellite and uh, obtain the precise images of, of, of the waves. However, the good resolution provides only by the low, uh, at the low high satellites. And they are not at the stationary orbit, so they are moving. Around, uh, around the Earth. And so we never may have enough 
satellites just above the earthquake area, etc., etc., etc. So far, just I mentioned only one of the possible approaches. And uh, as uh, we consider this as an introduction to tsunami simulation, I would like to speak a little about what is tsunami. I hope that most of you knows that, but uh, in order to have the line of the, of the talk, I would like to repeat <coughs> some basic, basic notions. So tsunami is the surface wave, wave on the ocean, which is driven by the gravity. And tsunami is generated mostly by the underwater earthquake. Mostly, but not only. It could be volcano eruption, landslide, or the other reasons. However, most of tsunamis, especially in the area of Pacific Ocean, most means that more than 90% are generated by the underwater earthquakes. Um, and of course, uh, uh, here it is not necessary to repeat that the word tsunami, which is now very well known all over the, the world, is a Japanese word. Why it is the harbor wave? Because um, the typical size of the uh, source of tsunami is the area, say rectangle, of course it's closer to ellipse or circle, say rectangle, 50 over 100 kilometers. During the earthquake, approximately at that area, the shape of the seabed, the bottom of the ocean, is changed. Some part elevates, some part goes down, and so the shape of the bottom is changed. And this change in the shape transmitted to the sea surface. The typical area is uh, 50 over 100 kilometers. This is the, say, the lowest area which may generate dangerous tsunami wave. As a rule, if the area is smaller, which means that the earthquake is not very strong, of course the tsunami wave is generated, but it is not dangerous. No harm, no damage, absolutely nothing. The amplitude of tsunami wave at tsunami source is compared to one meter. It could be half a meter, 60 centimeters. One meter is uh, valuable. If we compare this one meter tsunami wave with the wind wave, wind waves are much larger. Two meters is not dramatic. 3 meters, not dramatic, 6 meters is a large wave. And tsunami wave only 1 meter. Why tsunami is dangerous? Because the, in case of the wind wave, the wave height is comparable to the wave length. 6 meters high, 6, 10 meters back. However, in case of tsunami, 1 meter high but the length is tens of kilometers, maybe 100 kilometers. So it's a very, very low wave, but very, very long. And then approaching the coastal line, the wave started to be shorter, but higher. And so on, especially here in Japan, were uh, reported the tsunami waves with the height over 30 meters, 35 meters, etc. So that is why when you are in the open sea, in the, even in a small boat, you never have idea that the tsunami wave is passing beneath you. Only one meter elevation and the, along the very, very long way. And so this wave is dangerous only at the shoreline, and never in the open ocean. The rough scheme of the, of the 
tsunami wave generation is the seismic event, the uh, underground fault rupture. Then the displacement is translated to the Earth's surface because the epicenter could be 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers, 20 kilometers, very, very deep inside. And then the uh, displacement is translated to the Earth's surface. And if this uh, Earth surface is the seabed, then the shape of the seabed is changes. The water is practically not compressible. And so if we change the shape of the bottom, this changes practically immediately is translated to the sea surface. And so we have a disturbance at the, sea, at the sea surface. In tsunami simulation, some professors they study this transition processes from the seabed to the sea surface because this is not immediate process and so it could be calculated, etc., etc. But if we compare the, so, but uh, to our understanding, this is, not, this is not the core problem. If the seabed is changed, then the surface wave arises. And we prefer to measure directly the wave at the sea surface. This is the direct information. How large is the wave at the sea surface? So the wave is driven by the gravity, and uh, it may damage the coastal zone. The inundation area could be very, very large. The, uh, what, uh, the wave could be penetrated through the rivers, etc., etc., etc. So um, one of the related problem is the engineering. How should we construct the building at the coastal zone? We should account the possibility of tsunamis and construct properly. Especially here in Japan, I believe that your country is among the leaders of the seismic resistance construction. The high skyscrapers are very, very well constructed and even the large seismic events do not disturb the buildings. However, the construction of the, some objects, harbors, airports, power station at the coastal area, the tsunami, possible tsunami phenomena should be accounted. And uh, last but not least, we should install the early warning system. After the earthquake, we should say if this earthquake generates the dangerous tsunami and either it, it is not dangerous. And in many cases, the, after the same event, Tsunami wave is large and dangerous at this geographical location and maybe 100 and two, or 200 kilometers along the coastal line. No dangerous, no danger. So this is very, very important and delicate problem. So unfortunately, the available information after the earthquake is very few. Then we listen the news, only two numbers are given the magnitude and the, and the epicenter coordinates. So epicenter coordinates is the point. Previously, we mentioned that the area of uh, displacement of seabed, so the tsunami source, covers the large area, 50 over 100 kilometers, 100 over 200. And epicenter is not necessarily in the middle of this area. Could be close to the edge. And depending on that, tsunami could be dangerous or not dangerous. And the magnitude, it is just the number which characterizes the energy released during the earthquake. In case of two earthquakes, with the same magnitude, the same energy released, one may generate very dangerous tsunami, the other not. So these two numbers give practically no information about tsunami. So, um, among the tsunami professionals, this is one the trend how to study, how to understand the problem. This is based on the study of the structure of the Earth. If we know very well the structure of the Earth, then we can uh, 
suggest that this, during this particular earthquake, exactly these blocks which is under the earth moved in that direction with the, that amplitude. And then we recalculate this information because the seismologists uh, are uh, using to say we know exactly the structure of this rupture. If earthquake, which means that that block goes down, that block goes up, etc., etc. But then they start to recalculate what does that mean in terms of the changes of the sea surface. And during these calcula calculations, we insert many, many mistakes and many uncertainties. So this is the very good way to study, but uh, it never can provide us with the perfect information. Our point is that the more alternative methods we have, the better will be results. Just uh, one example, the rather small earthquake at Aleutan Islands in 1936, and uh, so uh, about 160 persons were dead at Hawaiian Island. However, uh, the wave approaches Hawaii after some hours, but immediately it passes the Unimak Island, only 100 kilometers in front of the epicenter. No damages, no signs of the of the larger of the large tsunami wave. The same earthquake, close to the earthquake, no danger, very far, very dangerous. So after the, that event, the Pacific tsunami warning system has been introduced. Example of the February 28, 2010, Tokyo. I made it, this picture at the Tamachi Station, Yamanote Line, by myself. And this day, uh, here, we expected the tsunami wave caused by the uh, strong earthquake close to Chile, which took place the day before. And it takes more than 20 hours for the wave to approach Japanese coastline from Chile. And uh, I remember that day very well. On all the TV screens, we have the map of Japan colored in three colors, depending on the expected height of the wave. The time that the wave attacked the coastline was the high, high tide. And it was especially dangerous. But the height of the wave was overestimated several times. On many regions, they expected more than three meters, but never more than 80 centimeters. So overestimating the wave shut down the traffic, uh, rail lines, etc., etc. So the economic uh, uh, damage was much higher than the damage from the tsunami wave. And still, we have no possibility to calculate that accurately. So, um, I would like to skip several slides and to show you some several formulas. So, uh, this is a tsunami is the surface wave. And there are several hydrodynamical models of how to calculate the motion of the, of, of the water. And uh, many investigations, many measurements shows that uh, the Euler's equation is enough to calculate the tsunami wave. This is the celebrated Euler system, not the Navier-Stokes. We consider water as the ideal liquid. And so the, this is, uh, the motion of the water is described by the Euler system. Here, V is the velocity vector, and G is the acceleration of gravity. Rho is the density, and P is pressure. This is a very, very well-known model in hydrodynamics. And um, in our particular case, the horizontal scale of motion is much larger than the depth why? Tsunami propagates hundreds and thousands of kilometers. The water depth is only a few kilometers. And the length of 
tsunami away is tens of kilometers. And so we can simplify the error equations. And after I uh, do not want to go into deep details, but uh, in, uh, so this is proved that this model works fairly well. The so-called shallow water approximation, or which is the same, the long wave approximation. The length of the wave is higher compared to the depth of the water. Average depth of the Pacific Ocean is compared to four kilometers. And the length of tsunami wave is tens of kilometers, so it's much longer. And so the error system could be simplified. So this is uh, exercise in calculus. We neglect some terms, and we neglect the products of the small terms. And then from the error system, which is slightly nonlinear, we can obtain two very simple equations. U is the uh, velocity vector and h is the height of the wave. And so here we suggest that we have only one space variable for simplicity. And so we have two equations which uh, connect the speed of the, the velocity vector and the height of the wave. And these two equations are very simple and we can exclude one of the unknowns. As we are interested in h, the height of the wave, not in the speed of the wave, we may exclude this. And we come out with the very, very simplified one-dimensional model. It's called one-dimensional, however, we have two dimensions, time and space, but only one space variable. In mathematics, it is called 1D model. And so, from this very rough model, we may uh, have a very important conclusion. If we suggest that the d, d is the depth of the water, is constant, we can take this constant out of the derivation. And this is the very well known in mathematics classical wave equation. And the Physics say us that this coefficient, which is g multiplied by d, is the square of the speed of the wave propagation. So the speed of the wave propagation is the square root of g over d. And now let us put d as the average depth of the Pacific Ocean, 4,000 meters, and g is acceleration of gravity, which is pretty close to 10 meters per second of the second. And if we extract the square root, we come out that the speed of the propagation is 200 meters per second, which is compared to 720 kilometers per hour. This is practically the cruise speed of the modern jet. The way it propagates, it doesn't mean that the water, the flow of the water, takes this dramatic speed. The shape of the way the shape of the surface goes propagates with this really incredible speed. This is the same uh, the same equation, but in two dimensions. We have x and x and y the direction along the surface, and this is the uh, governing equation for the uh, for the tsunami wave propagation. D is the depth profile, which is known but not exactly because we know exactly this coefficient only where the ships are passing. And if uh, practically no ships, we have the, we do not have the precise information. And this is the typical uh, struggle between the model precision and the computational cost. Even the simplified models, if we would like to uh, calculate the wave propagation of the Pacific, we should, uh, even on the rough mesh, we have maybe 3,000 points to cover the Pacific Ocean with the step 4 kilometers in one direction and 2,000 points in the other direction. So we have 10 million computation points. And in order to calculate the propagation of the wave from Chile to Japan, we need 
22 hours approximately, which means approximately uh, 9,000 steps in time. So the, uh, the, uh, we need the really advanced computational facilities, but I will I will concentrate on this slightly later. And now just to show you the idea, this is the map of the uh, year 2007. And these are the measurement stations to measure tsunami in the open ocean. The green stars are the stations existing at that time. Now we have this and these two stations. They are effective now. And uh, this uh, make us a hope to have slightly more stations and to make a step toward the real-time tsunami, tsunami simulation. So, uh, what are the stations? You see, after each star here, so uh, if you make a closer look, here are not only stars, but circles. Stars are the American stations, and the circles are the stations produced by the other countries. Most of the stations are Americans, and they also in insert several stations in the Atlantic Ocean and Caribbean, but most of them are around the Pacific. Around because the subduction zones where the earthquake may take place are here, 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 etc. Only at the subduction zones it may happen. And the idea is, for example, if the earthquake is taking place here, and first the wave passes the measurement system, the signal is translated to the data center through the satellite channels, and while the, earth, the wave propagates over the Pacific, you know that transocean flight is hours, so it takes hours to approach Hawaii, California, Japan, and we have time to process this data, and if our algorithms are good, we can predict rather good the expected type of tsunami waves at different geographical locations. Unfortunately, in Japan the situation is much poor because the, if we uh, protect, say, Los Angeles, which is somewhere here, it takes eight, nine hours for the way to approach Los Angeles from Alaska, from Eluden, Alaska Islands. However, here is the zone where the earthquake is taking place. And the typical traveling time from the uh, tsunami epicenter to the nearest shoreline in Japan is compared to 20 minutes only. So this is one of the challenge. We even do not have these hours. However, I did show the slide of the year of 2010. The earthquake took place close to Chile shoreline. It takes all the 20 hours for the way to cross the Pacific to approach the uh, Japan, uh, Japan, and still we do overestimate the wave heights. Unfortunately, we do not have at the moment in hands very good tools. We have an idea that these tools may work properly, but unfortunately, until now, we do not have a stable system. And, uh, we propose some ideas, and our hope is then combining them all together. We may have the reasonable prediction, of course not very, very precise. However, you, uh, the expected height of tsunami wave in front of the coastal line would be 10 meters, 12 meters, 8 meters. So, mistake in 10% is not dramatic. So the difference is either 2 meters or 10. But if it is 10 or 9 or 11, it doesn't that matter. It is very dangerous. If 20, it's very dangerous. So mistake by 10% is not dramatic in that case. And so we know 
that it is in principle possible to optimize the location of this measurement system. This is one of the points, and I will speak about that later, not, not today. And to achieve the um, prediction, say, within 15 minutes after the earthquake. This is, this is future. So what are these, uh, sometime uh, in the community we call them tsunamiters, just the measuring system to measure exactly tsunami. This is the floating buoys on the sea surface. But this is only the auxiliary device. The core of the system is the bottom pressure recorder. Bottom pressure recorder is a small device size compared to microphone and inside is the silicon stream and the turn of the stream characterizes the pressure of water. This device is located at the sea bottom, could be located at the depth up to 6,000 meters, so not at 10,000 meters, the engineering does work but from 4,000 to 6,000, it is fine. It is incredibly high pressure. You know that one at 10 meters of the earth provides an extra one atmosphere. So the pressure could be 600 atmospheres. And everything should work under that conditions. Then you know that this is an ocean water, salting water. So the device should work in this very aggressive environment and incredibly high pressure. So it measures the height of the water above with the precision of one centimeter. This is incredible, but this is the fact. It's very, very precise device. And the rest of the system is to, to record the signal and to transport it to the surface and then to the data center should be the anchor for the stable position, should be the processing, processing unit, should be the transducer, should be the battery pack, acoustic uh, release, this is the uh, acoustic channel to pass the signal to the flotating boots. This device is for what? Then the battery pack is older. We should send a ship, drag, this one and the special drag just uh, take uh, catch this one and extract that to the sea surface then change the battery back and put back now uh, the Americans uh, propose better technology cheaper because in the first release one system may cost 700,000 American dollars and on also the maintenance we should send a ship to take it to the surface, change the battery pack and put it back. Now the battery pack may work without recharging up to five years. It's a very good result. And now the Americans, we are in touch with uh, this uh, research unit which is located in Seattle, Washington. And so they propose to, if uh, this station stopped operates, they send a helicopter and just from helicopter push the other station close to here. This is the idea that probably they will start this technology shortly. So this is the uh, sensor, processing unit, transducer, and uh, battery pack. And this is the flotating buoys on an anchor. And uh, as an anchor, they do use the old um, wheels of the, of the train the old wheels, which can not be used any anymore for trains. They just use it for that. And, uh, and then the satellite uh, transition system. And so now, then the way it is passed over the measuring system, just in real time, we have the direct observation. This is not a hypothesis. This is the exact profile of the way which is passing over the measurement buoys. This is a very good data. So 
now a number of algorithms are proposed what to do with this data. How to read, so the idea is to repopulate this data first in terms of the displacement in the, in the source of tsunami and then to calculate more precisely the propagation of the wave over the ocean. There are several software packages which can do that. And uh, I mentioned here only two of those most method of splitting tsunami. This have been proposed by Americans, the same unit which proposed the measuring system. And the other is proposed again uh, with the participation with uh, the uh, Professor Mamura from Sendai, Japan. And then it have been, uh, say, updates several times now, but they have maybe a third or even fourth version of that. Here are some references to the authors of uh, the ideas of the algorithms, which, uh, which is composed the background of those software packages. I will show the pictures of uh, last year, maybe, maybe tomorrow, and these are the pictures after the earthquake in Indian Ocean in uh, December of the year 2005, where, so maybe, we do not have the precise numbers, but according to UNESCO data, maybe 250,000 uh, persons have been died over the Indian Ocean after that tragedy. And uh, these pictures are from the resort area in Thailand. And uh, previously I uh, told that area of this bad disturbance could be the area 50 kilometers over 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers over 200 kilometers. In that case, close to the Indonesian coastline, the area where the sea, the sea bed and therefore sea surface have been changed, is disturbed, where maybe again 50 kilometers width, but more than 1,000 kilometers then. And this may accumulate the weight. So first you have the block 100 kilometers over 50 kilometers, which going up, which generate the weight. And then the weight propagates beneath the other block of the same size going up, which push up the weight. This accumulation phenomena, of course, uh, took place. We also have some ideas how to attack this problem, the special case of the very, very, very long source of tsunami. But this, is, this fortunately, is a very rare event, and we do not expect similar event within hundreds of years. However, in principle, we should be ready even, even for that. One of the uh, prospective idea to our understanding is to calculate as much as possible prior to event. And therefore, by several research groups in uh, Japan, in Russia, in the United States, in Singapore, the so-called preliminary computation strategy is developed. The idea I show, the idea on the original area where it had been tested first time, this is a Liutka Alaskan, Alaskan subduction zone. So in, this is the subduction zone where the earth plate from here goes beneath the other earth plate. And therefore, the tensions are accumulated here and the release of this tension is an earthquake. And so the idea is to cover this subduction zone with the rectangles of the size 100 over 50 kilometers. And in that case, it is exactly uh, 50 rectangles. Then we put 
the typical disturbance, typical to this zone. Because the shape of disturbance are typical to some zones. So we put this typical disturbance to each rectangle and then calculate the wave propagation from this rectangle over all the Pacific Ocean, then from here, etc. And so we calculate the database, and that have been done by Americans. They have the database. And what is the idea? Then the real event happened. We now have the measurement of the wave at the measurement station here. And then we simulate this real signal as a linear combination of these simulated signals. So we do not need to solve the equations of hydrodynamics over all the city. We already did that. We only pick up from the database the proper parts and compose the linear combinations of them. And some tests shows that this technology, which is very far from optimal, because we suggest some specific form of initial display in some shape. In practice, there are different, some variations. So this is one of the direction of the further study to propose better system, which again, one of the constraints is the, the computational facilities. But on many pr practical examples, it works. It provides us with the reasonable information about the amplitude of the wave at the point of measurement. Therefore, the reasonable approximation of the wave height close to the shoreline. This technology is in use from one hand and under development from the other hand because it still does not work real time at the time being. But we hope to contribute in that direction and uh, force this technology to work real time. And I believe that for introduction to tsunami is more or less all I would like to share with you. And if you have questions, I, I will try to answer. And we will go into some deeper details tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. This over. Do you have any question or comment? Yes. Tsunami um, is only a wave, so uh, if someone from here has some velocity or energy or amplitude or wavelengths, um, if the tsunami, if the tsunami, same tsunami has the same energy, but the different, uh, different shape, different shape, yes, such as a very Low amplitude and very long wavelengths, or uh, very short wavelengths, but very high amplitude. But to, 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 they either have the same energy and same mass and same kinetic energies. But in engineering situations, what, what kind of parameters would we should no, uh, we should have? Uh, uh, basically, in the tsunami community, the wave H is considered as the basic parameter. The, uh, some, in, uh, if we go in better details, especially for the con engineering construction and solutions in the coastal zone, we also, uh, the, um, many buildings may be damaged, not by tsunami itself, but some objects which tsunami drag and push up, cars, vehicles, trees, etc. So, uh, we until now do not touch these engineering parts. This is the other, the other science. Because many, once again, many buildings can be damaged not by the water flow, but by some garbage which are driven with the water. And this is the other. And after this um, event in Indian Ocean, there are two small uh, houses at the sea. At the, at the shoreline. And uh, the houses are small, and typically the first uh, stage is a garage, and the second stage, the living room. And in one home, the 
the door of the garage was closed and the water destroyed it completely. And for the other, the doors of the garage were open. The flow passes through the door, destroyed the back wall, but the house was not damaged. Let's take this is the completely size how to reach perimeters. And for basically, if we should warn the population or not, the basic perimeter is the expected wave height, which directly attached to the inundation zone, how much square kilometers have been flooded, etc. etc. So this is only the the integrated perimeter. Even we are not able to provide the good prediction of this perimeter. This should be the first step. And then in more details, which is the basic direction of the wave, etc. Et Any other questions? from many fields who contribute to tsunami science, but what do you think the mathematical oriented, oriented research is advantage? Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, to my understanding, the models for the trans-oceanic propagation, we do not need uh, to have better models, because in terms of the traveling time, it's a very good agreement between the prediction and reality. However, the inundation models needs fast mathematics. How to account through friction to the bottom. So the order turn of the wave crest, etc, etc. So of course there is a good deal of work for mathematicians in this kind of Okay. about the structure of earth. Uh, I have heard that some kind of study, uh, we can research the structure of inside of us by researching the seismic wave at many places uh, uh, over the world. For example, if we have some earthquake in Japan, and other country, some, some um, the seismic station system is worldwide, system. right? Uh, study the wave. Then, at the other, uh, uh, um, another station can research a little bit different uh, seismic wave. So, if we compare the wave, we can know the inside of the earth. How can we connect this kind of study with this prediction? Thank you for the question. You are right. Uh, there are the many studies of the earth structure. But, uh, all of us know the medical tomography. There are tomographs. And so uh, our body is inspected by the special, uh, say, physical Wave. And then, due to many inspections from different directions, then we reconstruct the section, the distribution of the densities of our body, and then we know, etc., etc., etc. The same you are speaking about, this is the so-called seismic tomography. We never have that number of data to reconstruct precisely. However, our body, so the section of the body is maybe 30, 40 centimeters. The bone is uh, two, three centimeters. And if we mistake with uh, one millimeter, it doesn't matter for the diagnostics, etc. Earth, tens of thousands of kilometers. You see? So the mistake of uh, the same mistake in percentage means maybe kilometer of mistake. And this could be dramatic to the parameters. So in principle, yes. I touch briefly 
that if we if we do know the structure very well, then we can suggest that during this earthquake exactly that part of the plate goes two meters deeper, etc., etc. Only suggest, and we have only indirect data about that. The measurement in a very few point on the surface of the of Earth. If you compare the data of Japan Geological Survey, American Geological Survey, European, so they even uh, do not agree in the magnitude of the earthquake. According to the different data, the same earthquake have different magnitude. And the scale is logarithmic. So one unit is 10 times. So yes, this is very prospective and we should do that. However, the mistakes could be rather large. So I believe that predicting tsunami, the best is to have a direct measure on the sea surface because wave is already here. And this, this exactly, this wave is perfect. So please be relaxed because this is tea time. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, Professor Lavrentchev comes from uh, Novo Novosibirsk. <laughs> so please talk about the city Novosibirsk. <laughs> Sorry, Novosibirsk. Not uh, about the city of Novosibirsk. On the American maps, they have. Uh, different points for Novosibirsk and for Academy Town, the first academic city in the world. Legally, we are a part of the city, the same municipal authorities, etc. But in practice, we are slightly different. Located close at the edge, we are part of the city. And once again, on the American map, they have different points. So, and uh, probably you know that after this Academy Town, which has been uh, established in 1957, so practically 55 years ago. Different countries accept this experience as it had, as it is uh, very successful. And construct Tsukuba in Japan, a city in Korea, in France, etc. But we are the first with all the mistakes and the all the honor and perspective. So this is the idea of the map of Russia. And in, the, in yellow, I um, outlined the area covered by Siberian branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences. So we have Russian Academy of Sciences, which have several divisions. The Siberian divisions, in terms of the area, is the largest. In terms of funds and the number of employees, of course, not largest, but the covers this area, practically all Russia. Here is one of the picture of our academic city. The city downtown is somewhere here. And the city of Novosibirsk is the third city population in Russia, after Moscow and St. Petersburg. The third is Novosibirsk. Population is not large to the Japanese standard, 1.5 million. But in Russia, it's the third city of population. And here is our community. This is the main scientific prospect. And all the buildings you see here and here are research institutions, which belongs to Academy of Science. Institute for Cytology and Genetics, Institute for Mathematics, Institute for Automation, Institute for Geology and Geophysics, Institute for Nuclear Physics, Institute for Inorganic Chemistry, etc. So this is the research community, different institutions. North of the city university is here. So from this institute, 10 minutes walk. And we are in the main building of the North of the State University. The pictures of some institutes, this is the Institute for Nuclear Physics, the largest in Siberian division. An idea about 2,000 employees, about 2,000 employees in this institution. Uh, the other institutes, uh, here is the headquarter of the Siberian Division and the Institute for Economics, main building of the Institute for Mathematics, and 
that this, uh, in this building several medical institutes are, are located. Institute for Computational Mathematics and Natural Physics, Institute for Computational Technologies, and the uh, C Programming Institute. Just some numbers about Siberian Division. Numbers are subject to change, the percentage, etc., etc., but roughly speaking, the Siberian Division of the Russian Academy of Sciences is approximately 20% of the entire Russian Academy of Sciences, 20% in terms of the budget, in terms of the number of employees. And uh, one half of Siberian division is located in our community. This is our academic city. So within, roughly speaking, one university campus, we have 10% of resources of Russian Academy of Sciences. This is really, uh, so perhaps uh, about 10,000 researchers, 10,000 researchers. In the university, we have 6,000 students. And in the community, 10,000 researchers, more than one researcher for each student. So this is uh, amazing, and because of that, our university is, is very special. And the other point, uh, our community is interdisciplinary. We have institutions, several institutions, for example, in physics, in physics Institute for Nuclear Physics, Institute for Semiconductor Physics, Institute for Thermal Physics, Institute for Applied Pure and Applied Mechanics, Institute for Hydrodynamics. Several institutes in chemistry, in mathematics, geology, etc., etc. So this is the perfect platform for interdisciplinary researchers. And now the part of the budget of Siberian Division is uh, distributed on the base of competition for interdisciplinary researchers. So you apply for funds, and for sure should be several institutes in, in team. The team consists of the research groups from several institutes. Uh, as you probably know, the most promising area now is exactly in the, inter, in the interdisciplinary areas. Just a rough idea, this is the Institute for Mathematics, Sobolev Institute for Mathematics. The family Sobolev is very well known for pure mathematicians through Sobolev Spaces. And he's the founder of our institution and I worked there since the year of 1978. We have the Nobel Prize winner in our institution, uh, 75, uh, Leonid Kantorovich, who won the Nobel Prize. As we know, mathematicians, for mathematicians, it's forbidden to be the Nobel Prize winners, and he took this prize in economy with the theory of linear programming. And Lenin Prize during the Soviet years, it is the highest scientific prize in the uh, Soviet Union. Many uh, winner of this uh, prize in our institution. Hero of Socialist Labor, Lamanosov Gold Medal, Lobachevsky Prize and Gold Medal, Mindset Prize, etc., etc. So this is one institution and the recognition of the staff of the institution through the through 50 years, both at the international level and at the Russian or Soviet Union level. So to um, give you some number. This is the institute of typical size, about 400 employees, about 400 employees. So in the Institute for Nuclear Physics, 2000, but uh, they have a strong engineering department for to construct some, get some original equipment for design and construction. And in terms of researchers, they are not that large. And for mathematician, we know that uh, we don't know we do not need that number of support staff. So among these 400, 450 perhaps, over 120 full professors, and maybe one, uh, uh, more than one, uh, 100 PhDs. This is a very strong research institution. And most of the institutions are really highly reputed in the international community. 
there is the catalog of the applications because many researchers are of the applied orientation. But until now, this database doesn't work. There is the web resource, and potentially many companies are interested in, but uh, practically they do not visit and they do not use this uh, intellectual property. They're really the very good ideas. So we still have many things to do. There are so Novosibirsk is located in the very middle of Russia, both from east to west and from north to south. And of course it is Siberia, so we have very frosty and long winters. In the winter we may have minus 30 easily for many days, fortunately not for all the, all the, uh, all the winter. But in summer, it's a continental climate. So right now we have about plus 30. And uh, we do that the air is dry, the climate is continental. And we have an artificial sea, we call it open sea. Op is the name of the river, one of the largest uh, river, rivers worldwide. And in summer, we enjoy swimming, yachting, sightseeing, etc. Et but now, several words about Nosebel State University. Just several numbers, uh, several papers. This one is the letter signed by the governor of uh, Novosibirsk district, Mr. Tolakovsky, and addressed to Mr. Putin. At that time, he was president of Russia, then prime minister, now again president. And his resolution that uh, due to the, the, to the fact that uh, Novosibirsk State University is really very strong and good and mostly have not commercial students but the budget students, federal budget is paying for their education and so it is reasonable to construct the new building for this university on the federal money. This had been signed in the year 2005 and now the works are just, uh, we start the construction of the main building. This is one of the projects. Of course, the, uh, the, the final project is much simpler, much more economic, but uh, just uh, close to our main building. This is the current main building of the four levels. We are constructing the, the new one, which will double our, uh, our space for education. So our university is really very special. Approximately uh, one of the age our graduate students is uh, one of the yes uh, one of the age is PhD and among the PhDs one of the four is full professor. General statistics in Russia among ten PhDs we have one full professor and for our graduate students two times higher four PhDs, one professor. About 75 of our students are supported by the state budget. This is the only university in our city with this grade. In all other universities, two-thirds are commercial. 60%, 65, 70 are commercial students. In our one-third of this, one-fourth of the students are commercial. Most are uh, supported by the state. And also, if we compare the budget of our university and the other leading universities, leading means Moscow State University, St. Petersburg State University, Moscow State Technical University, Physical Technical Institute. So um, we have 2.5 less money, normalized by the number of students. What does that mean? So we have one position of professor for 10 budget students. And uh, the physical technical institution has one position of the professor for three budget students. Moscow State for four budget students. So we are not that well uh, supported in terms of the budget. However, still the level of our students is 
pretty much comparable is the leading uh, universities in Russia. One of the proof of that is the positions of the Russian universities in the prestigious international ratings. Unfortunately, our universities is far from the top 100. Several of them are in the top 1,000. But among the Russian universities, our Novosibirsk state is, according to the particular rating and uh, particular year, we are from the second to the fifth position. So according to the international community, we are among the best. Um, so this is just uh, some numbers. I do not want to go into details. Why we are the best? Because the educational process is based on the facilities of the Severan Division of Russian Academy of Sciences. Our university has been established the year after the Severan Division had been established, in order to prepare professionals for scientific researches. And so, uh, first, probably 85% of our professors, they have the main position in academy, in research, where we're having salary for research, and they are uh, the main position is in Academy of Science. And they're giving lectures and teach students on the part time basis. So we have very strong professors, first are actively doing science. In the United States, the system is slightly different. The professors have had a few classes and may uh, just. Uh, having classes, but if he would like to have some grants, etc., some travels, he should apply for grants, doing research, etc. This system is slightly different. We have the research institution, professor, so the employee of the academy should prepare reports on the international conferences and prepare scientific publications. If he is not doing that, he is not a researcher, only on the part-time basis in teaching students. And also our students have access to the library resources, scientific equipment, computer resources of the Severan Division. The Severan Division, as I mentioned previously, is 10% of all Russian Academy sciences. So that is why our uh, university is special. And with the uh, fact of the last years, we have very good relations with the high-tech companies. Uh, two names, uh, Intel, Intel Corporation, they open the research unit in our community because they are really very good programmers. And, they, and this uh, company, Intel Book, one software company, which has a really very strong uh, provider of developers. And now we have the joint laboratory, now Swiss State University Intel. We have joint labs. And the other example, Schlumberger, is uh, one of the largest worldwide service company for the uh, oil companies. It's not an oil company, it's a service company. But they have maybe 1,200 employees worldwide, etc., etc. And um, they select 45 to 50 universities worldwide, which they have the ambassadors of the company. We are one of those universities. They also open the engineering center in our community. Just two particular examples that our community is well recognized by, by the high tech company, worldwide reputed. So our, our university is performing the educational process based on the three prime principles. First, I just uh, dedicated to that my previous words. So uh, our professors, first they're doing science, and then two science and one medal, science and education. So this is one of the core principles of our university. Uh, second principle, we say first years in the university are dedicated to the basic courses, basic knowledge, and the specialization in the profession is the last year. 
So this should be done in the research institute or in the high tech company. Our master students are free of any classes for the last semester and have a few classes, roughly speaking, the uh, spent in the university two days a week. And the, uh, the three days a week, they should stay in the research lab or in the high tech company doing research for master business. This is the second progress. And the third, only three of them, the complete education system starting with the high school and as a part of our university we have the physical mathematical school we select the high school children from previously there from far east far uh, far country from all Siberia from Middle Asia republics now the area is not that large but still we select the high school children from different cities of the country and they live last two years of the high school out of their families in our community. And our professors are teaching also them as the high school students. And many of them enter the university. So we start to work with the prospective high school students. Then they enter the university. And also the part of our university is the College of Informatics. So as a part of the university, we have two colleges. Then university and then PhD courses. And uh, we have uh, a few PhD students in our university, but we should also account the number of PhD students of the North Siberian Scientific Center, because then our graduate students is choosing the PhD courses. They have two options, to be a PhD student of the university, and we have a few positions, or PhD students of academy, the same supervisor, the same research lab, the same topic for study, everything the same, but he uh, previously received the fellowship from the Ministry for Education, and now he received the fellowship from Academy. This is the only difference. So if we account also that, we have maybe 6,000 students, and more than one, uh, 1,050 PhD students, so a lot of PhD students, and then research institutes. So we support all this chain of preparation of the highest quality professionals. Just uh, several words, I can browse some slides. So uh, now, according to the new rules, there are two ways to enter the university in Russia. First is you should pass the unified exam, the unified exam, and we should accept the students According to the score, the system is still not stable, and the ministry changing the rules from year to year, sometimes slightly, sometimes dramatically, but changes every year, so it's really crazy. And the, the second way, you may be the winner of the Olympiads, high school Olympiads, in different, different uh, directions, math, physics, chemistry, biology, geology, whatever else. And this is one slide only twice in the final stage of the All Russia High School Olympics in programming were to the east from Ural Mountains. Any times Moscow says because it's close to there. Only two times in our university. This is the main sporting hall of our university. We cover that with a special cover. Distribute here more than 200 computers. And this is the final stage of the Olympics. Uh, for the high school pupils, having the diplomas of the winners. Each university obligatory should accept the student for budget position. And there were several levels of the Olympiads, but we accept almost a half of the students as the winners of the Olympiads, and a half of the students according to the score of the unified exams. So we do support Olympiads. This is IT area is closer to me, but we also support mathematics, physics, chemistry, etc. Et so we start to work with the high school students, and then, and then we try to attract the best of them as our students. And also we are um, looking for, for 
for you is the other part of the so-called uh, international ACM Association, Association for Computer Machinery International Collegiate Programming Contest. It's the world largest contest for student in, for students in programming. you some number. Uh, this contest of the first stage may be about 5,000 teams from 4,050 or 5,000 universities worldwide start the competition, which is arranged due, uh, according to geographical zones, etc., etc. And for final, they select about 100 teams. Maybe within the last 12 years, 10 times our team were within these 100. It's a really competition, very high competition, very tough competition, and we are doing that. To support this team, we arrange our own Olympiad, which is, which is arranged in Novosibirsk, but this is, the, this is the location of Novosibirsk on the map of Russia, and this is the uh, area of participants of our Olympiad. The best teams from Moscow, St. Petersburg, are going to us. Why? Because we find a very good sponsor, Samsung Electronics, and they pay a very good uh, price for the winners, etc. So again, we are working with the students permanently. These are several, for several years, uh, our team, which are a member of the finals, and this is our first, our best result, the fifth score in the year of uh, 2007. At that time, this uh, final took place in Tokyo. Here, and we win the silver medal. And uh, just to give you an idea, the four first teams gold medal, four teams uh, silver medal, four teams bronze medal. And uh, the score, say, uh, with the uh, gold medalist, uh, four score. It was MIT. They their score was 700. 68, our score 766. <laughs> so we were very, very close to the gold medal. And our uh, all of our rectors used to ask me why we are not winner. Never. And my typical answer is because our students first are students and the next are members of the team. And they in some universities they break the students' classes for the team for two, three months only preparing for these finals. We're never doing that. They're trained only through the exam days. Anyway, this is a very good result, and I hope that uh, we will proceed. And so after that, uh, they had a meeting with Mr. Medvedev, and uh, uh, our authorities well recognized the best teams in, in program. And probably the this is it. I just uh, can show you pictures about the new thing in our community, the arrangement of the techno park in Russia, which is uh, ordered by Mr. Putin in uh, 05. This are uh, the imagination, the projects, etc., etc. Now the buildings are under construction. I can download from the internet the uh, correct pictures. And this building is, is ready now. This it is in use for the for the techno park purposes. They have also, uh, already over 200 residents, the companies which would like to work this techno park with that environment, and the most of the employees of these companies are our graduate students. So uh, I believe this is the brief introduction. I overstepped the time, and I'm sorry about that. Thank you very much. Are you any quick there are there any questions? Okay. Ah. May I speak in Russian? Yes, I hope that I can because I, it is a little bit easier for me to speak in Russian, so I'm pleased to hear that. Uh, no, but you are spasiva. И сейчас назвали, сейчас сначала мы назвали всего три принципа вашего университета. И 
チャンスなしでペロビプリンス、無理やオシバンカフィス。これで、スネプリダルジュネウチーツァ、トリカパーズ、ブルバボツァ、トレナサウ、アトレス、コトチンオセルナ、ザニマエツァイス、サセミアサグラス、スタイチョパジャーサ、レイタロウ、ナシオバミバリセ。Меня пока два вопроса. Но прошу прощения, я филот, я русист. К сожалению, я никак не специалист по этой области, по области цунами. Так что. И первый вопрос такой, что он значит население вашего города. То есть, а мы... Да, да, это я помню. То есть, нам известно, что, например, на Дальнем Востоке, тем более на Сахалине, население очень уменьшается. Они никак не желают остаться, например, в Бразилии, студенты после окончания университета, они желают уехать в Москву, в Петербург, так как мне сказали. И по этому поводу, вот, население вашего города, это сейчас увеличивается и уменьшается. Увеличивается. Это центр целой провинции и стремятся наоборот. В Сибири целое население уменьшается, но у нас в городе увеличивается. И второй вопрос такой, что вы сейчас сказали, что бюджет, то есть идет же бюджет, ваш университет получает два или два с половиной меньше учебников по сравнению с другими главными университетами. И я замечаю, что в прошлом году у вас в России всего шесть университетов мы выиграли, и они стали федеральными университетами. И мы еще не замечаем, что это статус более, как сказать, высокий статус. Да. статус да. И хотелось бы узнать, например, с финансовой точки зрения или с, с другой точки зрения вот эти шесть университетов, какое, как, какое условие поражение условия поражения? Разрешите ответить по 10, чтобы... Да, да, да. Но, спасибо за... Что начало по японски. あの、えっと、教養学校の澤田と申しますあの英語が下手くさなものでどちらもで質問させていただきますで最初に申し上げましたのはあの今あのこのノベルシビウスの大学の3つの,あのプリンスプルっていうことをお話しされて、まあ、特に第一のプリンスプルがいつも気に入ったつまり学生っていうのは非常にしっかりと研究をしておる教授に一つのように教えられなければいけないっていうことがあって、まあ、全くあの賛成であるで質問は2点、今申し上げる。1点は人口に関してですね、あの今、極東地方、ウラジオソフトなんかもそうですけど、サハリンでもあの人口が非常に減っておりますけれども、えー、このロゴシビリスクについてはどうかとあの伺いましたら、まあ、あの増えておると、ロゴシビリスクについては人口は増えておるというお返事をいたしました。それから2つ目の質問は、あの去年だと思うんですけれども、あの全ロシアで6つの大学っていうのが選ばれましてあのそれまでの国立大学は連邦大学っていうふうに、まあ、あのなりましたあのステータスの一つ上がったっていうふうに聞いておりますけどそういう連邦大学の、まあ、状態っていうかそういうさっきあの予算の問題ありましたけどもあのそんなところで連邦大学っていうのはど,どういう状態のものですかということを伺いましたあの第2点に関しては今これから英語でお返事いただけると思います。So uh, now in Russia, we have several categories of the universities. We have two national universities. Let me use the mic. So two national universities. This is Moscow State University and St. Petersburg State University. And they have a special budget, special funds, and they are only two. We have eight federal universities. So the, uh, legally, the territory of Russia is dropped into eight, say, districts, federal districts, which is so uh, 
and in each district only one federal university. In Siberia, this is the university in Krasnoyarsk, Siberian Federal University. And uh, we did not took part in that competition. Why? Because the idea was to unify several universities as one new enterprise and give them some money that larger universities with the idea that larger is better, which is not necessarily truth. So in Krasnoyarsk, they joined together four different universities. And for several years, they really had many, many problems. As uh, compensation, they have some special funds for construction buildings, etc., etc. But we are a small university, and we can handle our 6,000 students. Because, as I told you, we have 10,000 researchers. So one researcher for one stu student as a tutor, okay. If we have 40,000 students, we never may have the same quality of education. So we did not even participate in the competition. Because the idea was to unify several universities in Novosibirsk, but we have Novosibirsk State Technical University with maybe 24,000 students. And so if we join 24,000 students and 6,000 students, of course, the uh, the control will be from that side, from that larger side. So we did not put part. And the third category, uh, these are the national research universities. This, uh, say, have been awarded by government based on the competition. And we win the first stage of the competition. So in Russia, we have about 800 universities supported by the state authorities. So two national, eight federals, federal, and 40 research universities. So, so we are national research universities. But about 50 universities are selected, and 750 are just regular universities. universities. So we are national research universities. And um, as for the basic funds, two ministers for education or for Russia promised us to change this situation. But due to some bureaucratic reasons, we still do not have the changes. Since May, we have the new minister for education. So our hope is that finally, they recognize that our university is good university and they raise our budget. Thank you for the speakers. Thank you. So, why not take a photo together?
ビデオもう止めても大丈夫ですか。